think there's hope for it, but it's difficult to say whether or not it's going to pan out that way. The Channel Islands, an archipelago of British Crown dependencies in the English Channel, lying just off the French coast of Normandy. The islands are renowned as a melting pot of British and French heritage, along with a huge variety of landscapes. But it isn't the landscapes that I am interested in, but the skies above them, the darkest skies in Britain. Guernsey, the second largest of the Channel Islands, is just a stop-off point for me. The island of Sark is my destination and is an hour's boat ride away. It is the world's first dark sky island. Alright, so I'm here in Guernsey in the Castle Lodge Hotel. Um, it's half nine and I've got the ferry at 11am to head over to Sark. I wanted to feel the full effect of the skies in Sark, so I began my search in London. Geographically not far from the Channel Islands, but visually they are worlds apart. London is home to almost 8 million people, and during the daylight hours it is a metropolis with a palette of greys and browns. Whilst in London, I met with Dr. Marek Kakula from the Royal Observatory Greenwich. When the Royal Observatory was founded in the 17th century, Greenwich would have been a tiny village outside London, so there was no light pollution at all, and, and even in London itself, it would have been dark at night. Now, in the 21st century, of course, we're surrounded by London and we're right opposite to the towers of Canary Wharf, so light pollution is a massive problem for us, and there are some things in the night sky that you will just never see from Greenwich these days. There are loads of things that people can do to reduce light pollution. Um, one of the main causes of it is uh, badly lit buildings and bad security lighting. There's nothing wrong with trying to light the ground um, to, so that you can see what you're doing, but uh, often a lot of the lighting actually spills straight upwards into the sky. So it's wasting light, it's wasting electricity, it's wasting money, it's producing an unnecessary carbon footprint, and it's not actually doing what it's meant to do, which is lighting the ground where you want the light to go. The night sky has always been full of amazing things and I think that's not going away. With uh, the improvements in technology and astronomy, we're discovering more and more about the universe and I think that's only going to increase over the next few years. But astronomers have to put their telescopes in the darkest places in the world and even these days up into space, so well away from any sources of light pollution here on Earth. So I think it's rather ironic that um, while we're going to discover more and more fascinating things about the universe that we live in, most of us are not going to be able to see much of that with the naked eye and we're going to have to rely on photographs and images taken with powerful telescopes away from centres of population. But as the sun sets, the lights of low-flying planes fill the skies of London. And on a clear night, you may only see the moon and perhaps a distant planet. The stars, however, are rarely visible, and they are cloaked by the light pollution emanating from the city. They are present, but barely noticeable. On my search for darker skies, I left the city and headed southwest. Cornwall is considered a largely rural area with no major cities. However, there are still large areas with light pollution. Whilst in Cornwall, I worked with field researchers hired by Exeter University to discover the environmental effects of light pollution. So we're working uh, by some employed on a project called Ecolite, which is a European Union funded project um, 
basically looking at the impacts of light pollution on um, the environment and particularly on, on the ecological processes um, and plants and animals essentially. The problem with studying light pollution is that it's very closely correlated with um, urbanisation. And so partitioning those two things from one another in terms of their impacts on the environment can be quite, quite difficult. Um, you know, we know that um, light pollution is affecting animal behaviour. We know it's having um, some kind of impacts at the community level. We don't know is how that scales up onto large spatial scales, nationwide scales, whether that's affecting whole invertebrate populations, whether it's causing declines in moth species or such and so forth. We can't really afford to do nature conservation in small sort of nature reserves and just say this is a natural environment and mm. you know, most of our nature is actually in farmland, in towns and cities and suburbs, you know, it's, it's all mixed in and we can't simply parcel off an area of wild um, wilderness and say this is a nature reserve and you know, that's where nature goes. Actually, we've got to start managing nature within suburban contexts and in, in, within gardens and within urban ecosystems and within sort of the wider countryside. Yes, I guess I guess it kind of fits into this thing of we need to we need to figure out how to manage our environment better, as opposed to how to manage the natural environment yeah. better. Yeah. And that's that's kind of I guess that's kind of one of the purposes of the ESI. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of experimental stuff going on with councils at the moment with um, the economy going under, so councils are experimenting with turning street lights off. Um, there's obviously going to be opposition in terms of public opinion to that because people are afraid and people don't like walking down dark streets at night. And um, I guess there, there may be surveys done, we might see some statistics come out um, for some authorities sometime in the next couple of years on crime levels and such and so forth to see whether those things have had an effect. I think provided the nighttime switch-offs um, don't seem to be having an effect on crime levels. I don't see any reason why it can't then carry on, which, which would suggest that the dark sky dream is a very real dream. So yeah, I think, I think there's hope for it, but it's difficult to say whether or not it's going to pan out that way at this stage. I arrived on the island on the first day of the Sark Astronomical Society Dark Sky Weekend. Sark is the smallest of the four main Channel Islands, located some 80 miles off the south coast of England. So yeah, I've been here for about a day and the weather is not looking great as you can see, it's just pure white as far as the eye can see. There's no break in any of the clouds uh, and it's been like that since I got here actually yesterday. So last night there was not a star in sight. In January 2011, Sark was designated a dark sky community and the first dark sky island in the world. This designation means that Sark is sufficiently clear of light pollution to allow naked eye astronomy. I met with Joe Birch who was key when implementing the dark sky campaign. Well, the first thing we had to do was to measure the amount of light that was polluting or not polluting the sky. So that meant Steve Owens, the astronomer, for 2009 was over here. We went on a night walk all the way from Little Sark to the North End and he measured at various points the night sky. And then he compared them with very dark places on Earth and very light places and decided that we were pretty dark. I think we ought to appreciate our nice night skies. I think wildlife needs, needs dark. I think humans need dark. And um, kids love to go out in the dark, you know, if you can remember when you were a child. So I think that we have raised an awareness of it's good not to waste power by sending it upwards and outwards, and it's good to appreciate the lovely night sky. You see the moon in a city, but that's about all really. You might see a few of the bigger planets. Um, so I think that's an experience they're all missing out on. I'm not even certain that the whole business of security works. I mean, they talk about, oh, we need them on for security, but crime is there, and whether you've lit lit the place or not. I think it's mostly a question of just wasting the electricity we've got. Seen from outer space, parts of Europe are just unbelievably lit up. Well, I just hope that it's one more thing we can offer people to come and enjoy in Sark. Also, it, some of the best times for, 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 for uh, stargazing are actually during the winter months. Not necessarily January and February because it's cold and 
um, it's difficult to get to SART, but October is a superb time, the island is still open. Summertime, you've got to wait till half past nine, ten before it's dark. So I hope that it's one more thing we can offer for visitors to SARC. Back across the water in Cornwall, I was on my way to the Roseland Observatory in St. Austell to speak to the resident astronomer Brian Sheen. Right, well, we're lucky that this particular location is sent, is in a, a large shallow bowl, really, in the ground. So it means that we're surrounded by hills on every side, which are not very big, but nevertheless do cut out the lights from St. Austell and from Newquay. We just get a little bit of a glow from St. Stephen, but uh, it's nothing really to get worried about. Light pollution is a problem for us because if you get too much of it then you can't see the fainter objects that we're trying to point our telescopes at and uh, that's why we've selected the position that we're in here at Court Farm. I think the night sky, people have always watched the night sky and wondered how it all is and why it works the way it does and we've got a far greater understanding now than we've ever ever had before and what we're trying to do here at uh, Court Farm is to sort of link the people with their sort of television knowledge, if you like, with the greater universe and our place within it. And we're af afraid really as the knowledge is increasing so that the information that the individual people have in the, in the public is diminishing. I think uh, light pollution is something which, uh, to a less, greater or lesser extent, we've all got in our own hands. We should be aware of leaving lights on in garden sheds and things like that, which are a nuisance. Uh, certainly so far as uh, the um, an anti-thief type floodlights, they really only give a dark shadow for the thieves to hide in and they don't actually serve the purpose for which they're put up. And to obviously keep a weather eye on what the council are up to. Illuminated signs in certain big cities, of course, uh, and um, various other uh, floodlit areas, which no need to be. It was nearing the end of my stay on Sark. And on the last day of the Dark Sky Weekend, I met with the head of the Astronomical Society, Annie Dassinger. Well, as you know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, the chairperson of our um, Astronomy Society in Sark. Um, I, I didn't start off that way, that was somebody else, but they quickly realised it was rather an onerous position. And um, I've got more time. And I've become terribly involved with it, and I love it. I love doing it. Um, I love being able to phone people up with all the authority of being a chairwoman of Sastros and saying, would you like to be our guest speaker at uh, our next event that we're having on Sark? We are seeing a few more visitors and we've only been at Dark Sky Island for just over, barely over a year. And we, we are working very hard to publicise it. Um, we are beginning to see an increase in visitor numbers, especially in the winter. To me, I go out um, usually before I actually go to bed, and sometimes in the middle of the night if I have to get up for anything at all, I can just nip out into my garden and, and just, you know, look at the stars. And so it's like you're the only person in the world in that sort of situation. It's so quiet and it's so beautiful. And you feel as if Mother Nature's turning everything on just for you alone. During my first few days on Sark, the weather didn't allow me to see the stars. It wasn't until the clouds ran their course and the mist lifted that I was given the pleasure of viewing the night sky.
there are few places left with such little light pollution. The sky in Sark was breathtaking, but as you can see, even the slight bit of light spilling out from a lit room can hinder the view of the night sky and create this only too familiar orange glow. I truly hope Sark manages to maintain its stronghold of darkness, but with population increase and island politics, it may become a larger problem. People are working all over the country to discover how intrusive light can affect astronomy and how light pollution can affect plants, animals, and perhaps even humans. With urban developments, our night skies are only going to become more polluted, and it is key that we implement improved lighting plans. There is a lot we can learn from this tiny island of Sark, the world's first dark sky island.